Thank you all for signing up and showing up on a Friday night. I know among the audience, there's loads of um, kindred spirits and friends, um, past event organizers and great thinkers. And I'm really thrilled to meet you and to be introducing tonight's opening conversation. There are lots of other things happening this weekend for Lost Species Day 2020 and on Monday, which is Lost Species Day itself. And we're hosting a film screening tomorrow and a ritual on Sunday via Zoom. And you can find out about what else is happening through our social media channels, which are at Lost Species Day. Thank you to um, friends in Turtle Island who are here on the holiday weekend. And also to any friends who are joining us from time zones where it's very late or very early right now. We really appreciate you showing up. Before I say more, I just want to cover some housekeeping. For accessibility, this evening, this evening's speakers will give their pronouns and give uh, brief visual descriptions of themselves before they present. We will be recording and sharing a subtitled version of this event afterwards um, on YouTube. And we decided to keep all of the events as meetings so that people can meet each other because that was part of the purpose of um, this weekend. But feel free to hide if you want to. Um, so the weekender, um, just talk a little bit about the event structure. So tonight's event is a whole in itself, as is tomorrow and Sunday, but they also form parts of a whole and we'll be going deeper into the questions raised tonight over the weekend. So we like warmly encourage you to stay with us for all three events. I'm just going to speak for about 10 minutes and then hand over to Suzanne Dalliwell, who will chair a conversation between herself, Dr. Sadia Qureshi and Dr. Audra Mitchell for about an hour. Please remain muted during the conversation, but if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we will come back to them after a comfort break and without the speakers. So yes, when they finish talking, there'll be a break and then a chance to discuss and have conversation in smaller groups. But take breaks whenever you need. Just to say tonight's gonna to be quite an intellectual space, but feelings are also welcome. Um, this is really a space for emotions as well as the concept. Um, there may be some language that's challenging. Uh, if there's terms you don't understand, just Google them or put them in the chat and um, another attendee or someone from the team will help you. And yeah, emotions. The context of um, this weekend is ecological loss and white supremacy culture. The context is the rapid destruction of the living world and the ways of life that have sustained it. The context is late hypercapitalism, mass extinction, to up to 200 species disappearing every day. It's fires raging across continents, billions of wild animals burned, indigenous cultures decimated, genocidal corporate theft and murder, and now pandemic. Alongside that, today is recognized as the busiest day for shopping in the year, and yet the context is also resistance, reimagining, unlearning and reframing. So yes, this is an event for feelings. The initiative was born from the co-founders emotional response to mass extinction. It's a response to the overvaluing of statistics, colonial science and materialism and their inadequacy for helping people access and process their responses to this ecocidal, genocidal dominant culture. So yes, this is a good space for you to be at home in good company with your emotions. Right, so that's the housekeeping. And now it's done, I'd really like to set some intentions for the event and for the weekend. So <clears throat> first I would like to acknowledge and give thanks to the earth that holds us all. I'd like to give thanks for its abundant life-giving systems. Thanks for the people and cultures whose lives, labor and creativity support the ongoingness of the earth of the earth and its life-giving systems. And I'm grateful for your presence and your commitment to this learning together. I also just need to name, um, I mean, in, in gratitude, the, um, the, the people involved in the weekend and in Lost Species Day over the years, the people who are co-hosting the weekend alongside me, our co-founders, Emily Laurent and Rachel Porter, and our long-term collaborators, Becky Leach and Ben McFadden, along with Madeline Kelly. And there are many other people on whose energy and care this project rests and has rested over the years. Specifically, 
long-term project allies, Megan Hollingsworth of Extinction Witness, Andreas Corneval of The Life Ken, Matthew Stanfield, Nigel Raymond, Svenja Mayericks, Laura Coleman, Saswana Amoa, Lydia Heath, Nick Hunt, Beck Samson, and Bridget McKenzie. Thank you. So now just for a little bit of background to the project. When I say we and us in this talk, I'm referring to myself and the co-founders and long-term supporters of Lost Species Day. And again, we just want to acknowledge white supremacy culture as the overarching context of this event and the risk and likelihood of reproducing this in this event run largely on volunteer energy and largely by white people. The weekend is an experiment and our intention is to center justice in our work and language and to try and make spaces for thinking beyond species and to invite ways of thinking about species and mass extinction that are fit for purpose. Over the past decade, participants have held events on Lost Species Day, November the 30th, to learn about and remember extinct species and collectively acknowledge emotions such as grief and anxiety around ecological destruction. As an artist-led project, we recognize the need for cultural tools and practices in telling fuller stories around extinction. And so it is vital that Lost Species Day is grounded in consciousness that the harms due to colonialism and extractivism have been happening for centuries and that communities around the world endure conditions that many people in the global north assume are in the future. Modern species extinctions are driven by capitalism with its racist foundations so environmental projects must address the uneven, unfair human impacts of environmental change. Many do not, and historically have made these harms worse. We acknowledge this racist history of the white-led environmental movement and acknowledge that the original aims of Lost Species Day were politically inadequate. We commit to supporting the work and amplifying the leadership of environmental defenders of colour and to being active in the anti-racist, anti-capitalist environmental movement. Confronting and working to dismantle white supremacy is a messy and difficult process with no end in sight. But we hope that Lost Species Day can offer opportunities to explore ways of working creatively with grief in the service of justice and fairness. And the thinkers we're thrilled to be hosting this evening are all truly great teachers who've influenced the project and whose work helps to dismantle inherited assumptions. So I'm delighted to introduce the chair of the conversation, Suzanne Dhaliwal, who is an extraordinary teacher and artist She's a climate justice creative, a tireless campaigner, brilliant researcher, lecturer, powerful trainer, and all around general extreme badass. In 2009, she co-founded the UK Tar Sands Network, which challenged BP and Shell's investments in the Canadian Tar Sands in solidarity with frontline indigenous communities, and then spurred the internationalization of the fossil fuel divestment movement. Suzanne's led campaigns and artistic interventions to challenge fossil fuel investments in the Arctic and Nigeria that violate the rights of indigenous peoples and of those seeking justice in the wake of the BP Gulf of Mexico disaster. I hand over to Suzanne. Hi everyone and hi Percy. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'd, I'm really delighted to hold space and go on this co-inquiry with you all this evening. Um, as it's already been said, there's so many things that we could be doing this evening, but I think it's really important that we take time um, at this time of isolation and separation with everything that's going on. Um, often the climate crisis and the ecological crisis can feel really far removed or deprioritized given the corona crisis. Um, however, we all know that they're intimately linked and that the pandemic that we're facing is a symptom of the rapid um, ongoing deforestation, devastation to the environment and to the communities that have been safeguarding that. So I just wanted to acknowledge you all for joining. Um, and I'm gonna give the, the description um, for our um, friends who are listening. So I'm a small um, queer brown woman, got curly hair and the background is a stone wall um, with some plants as well. So just to create that picture of where we are. Um, so, Again, I just want to frame a little bit 
as the chair, I'm going to be taking a little bit of <laughs> liberties with that um, and sort of sharing with you a little bit about my research questions and why I'm so excited to hear from Audra and Sadia this evening. Um, as Percy mentioned, a lot of the work around environmental justice and climate justice involves recentering um, the voices, the strategies and the histories of climate and environmental movements that often have been um, forgotten or waylaid, especially in the last few years. Um, a lot about what we're going to be talking about this evening around extinction um, is a phrase that has brought alarm, necessary alarm, to the climate crisis, but it has also undone a lot of the histories and a lot of the awareness of the climate movements and the environmental movements who got us to this point today. So I think that's why it's really important that we take this time to unpack um, the history of extinction, the science around it and the understandings of it, and to go deeper with these intersectional frameworks that Audra and Sadia are gonna share with us this evening. So I'm just gonna um, pause at that um, and just sort of, again, just emphasize that, um, you know, the narratives that we bring to this work are so key. They're so key in terms of how we define the crisis and how we um, move forward with it as well. I was just reflecting on the stages of grief. And I think, you know, one of the stages of grief is loneliness. Um, that's usually the bottom of the arc. And so if we can be together at this time to work through these stages of grief, I think that's where we can also move into hope and to new ways of working, even in this time of pandemic towards ecological justice. So I'm gonna now introduce our other two speakers. Um, so first off, we have Sadia Qureshi is a cultural and social historian of race, science and empire in the modern world, whose research explores the ways in which racialized knowledge is produced, circulated and mobilized in the modern world. Sadia is currently working on her second book, provisionally titled Vanished, Episodes in the History of Extinction. Drawing on the histories of genocide, settler colonial studies and animal studies, Vanished will explore how the notion of extinction emerged and shaped our relationship with the natural world in the Anthropocene. Really exciting. And our second speaker is Audra Mitchell. And thanks Audra for joining us um, from Turtle Island this evening. Um, and Audra currently holds the Canada Research Chair in Global Political Ecology at the Belsil School of International Affairs. Her research and teaching and community engagement addresses global ecological harms through the lens of multi-scale sculptural violence, sorry, multi-scale structural violence. This includes increasing understanding the connections between ecological harms and ongoing global patterns of colonization, genocide, gendered and sexual violence and global capitalism. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'm so, honored to have this co-inquiry um, this evening as so much of the work around extraction um, weaves with these themes of sexual violence and intersectional movements to respond to this. So without further ado, um, I want to pass over to you, Audra, to ground us. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. And I'm sorry, I think I may have a little bit of a delay. So apologies in advance if I'm cutting anyone off. Um, so I just wanted to start uh, by acknowledging that I'm joining you this evening. And in a way, we're, we're all sort of gathering virtually um, on the lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, uh, and Attawadaran neutral um, peoples, uh, where I'm a visitor uh, and where the settler state of Canada currently is occupying. Um, I want to acknowledge that these lands are and always will be Indigenous lands. Um, so this, what I've, what I've done there is a land acknowledgement. Um, some of you may, may be familiar with them, may engage in them. Um, within settler colonial states, it's a way of, first of all, naming the elephant in the room, saying, you know, personally for me as a, as a white settler, saying I am, a, I am a person who is here, not at the behest of the people whose land it is. I am here as part of a settler structure. Um, but also it's a way of expressing respect and honor for the ancestors, present and future generations of the indigenous people and people of color, um, especially here in Turtle Island, 
uh, so many bodies have been moved forcefully across these lands and instrumentalized in various forms of violence. So it's also a way to, to do honor to, to those folks. And especially, uh, as Suzanne mentioned earlier today, down south of the, the medicine line, uh, it is uh, Thanksgiving. Um, I've seen some really interesting uh, takes on it as, as thanks taking. I think this is a nice, you know, while we're talking about mourning and remembering, it's a, it's a nice opportunity to think about everything that settler colonial states have, have taken, um, as well as gratitude towards the peoples who have created and, and sustained these lands. So that's just a little bit about land acknowledgements. Um, if anybody is interested, I'm happy to provide links to some, some sources on that and, and to talk about it further. Okay, thank you for grounding us with that acknowledgement. So I'm going to kick off um, with this exploratory conversation and I want to encourage you to gather your questions and gather your thoughts that emerge as you're listening. There's going to be an opportunity in the second half of the event to come together in small rooms. As Percy mentioned, you know, this is really a chance to think together and bring those questions there as well. So write down your questions, think about them, and we'll also be watching the chat. Okay, so Sadia, I'm going to um, pass to you for the first question. Um, so extinction, you know, is in the grand scheme of, of the planet, the history of the planet, um, is a relatively modern idea. Um, can you tell us how the word entered into the mainstream of uh, Western science and what problems its history raises regards to what we've been talking about, about this um, grounding of social and racial justice? Thank you very, very much. Thank you to everyone who's here. Uh, for those of you who need a visual description, I'm a South Asian woman. I'm just <laughs> wearing glasses and covering my hair because I'm also Muslim. Um, in the background, I have the classic book backdrop, but I also do have a little dodo and Tipu's tiger stuffed toy, which is very important. So coming back to the question, I think um, this, what's really incredible about extinction is that I think we often grow up with it as it, and it's very, very familiar to us because, you know, maybe we play with toy dinosaurs, maybe we go to visit natural history museums and things like that. So it's really quite difficult to imagine a world where that isn't a constant ever present moment but, or process rather, but that is absolutely the case in the early modern world. When people tend to think about extinction or talk about it, they often talk about it with respect to, for instance, debt you know, or abolition of enslavement or the ending of a family lineage. They don't often talk about it with respect to the natural world. When they do, it tends to be with respect to animals such as the dodo, but very much in terms of human induced extinction. It's not really thought of as something that happens in the natural world all the time as a matter of course. And that changes very, very recently, I think in, in where historians had in the late 18th century, with very, very detailed work on fossils. So for instance, there's a very important French anatomist called Georges Cuvier. He's extremely famous. He works in Paris and he's famous for saying that he can reconstruct an entire animal from a single bone. Um, so he's this kind of, you know, polymathic uh, comparative anatomist. And what he does is he starts comparing fossilized remains of mastodons and elephants. And he publishes research on this and he shows that Ele living elephants and mastodons are definitely different species and he speculates that the mastodon is both extinct and that it probably happened in some kind of catastrophic event and it's that kind of detailed research that makes extinction something that scientists think about and discuss as being a plausible process within the natural world and what's extraordinary is how quickly that idea then gets taken up um, amongst Scientists say, for instance, geologists or comparative anatomists or people looking at ancient peoples is very, very quick within a few decades. In broader public discourse, it actually happens through things like Alice in Wonderland, for instance, making the icon of the dodo picture uh, famous. So if you've ever seen the original illustrations, you will know that, you know, John Tenniel's image of the dodo and so on. I and mean, it's with circulations of those kinds of images that uh, these kinds of ideas about a species that no longer exists or an animal that no longer exists becomes much, much more broadly popular. So in that sense, it is a very, very modern idea. And I think it's really important to remember that um, and the ways that that idea circulates. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. And Audra, just passing back to you. Um, yeah, how for you, how does that picture of that history emerge? Um, 
Mm. Well, you know, that resonates a lot with me. I don't want to add too much more to the history of extinction itself. Um, but what I would like to talk about are some other words that go along with it, uh, conservation and biodiversity. So when we think about conservation, um, I go to thinkers like Dorsetta Taylor and Bill Adams, who have shown how it really is rooted in colonial elite hunting practices, territorial expansion, norms of whiteness, maleness, and binary gendering, uh, capitalist accumulation. Um, and so, you know, we see major uh, conservation organizations like the WWF or Conservation International continuing to reproduce these structures in their leadership and their funding and support structures. You know, it's not, it's a, it's not a new thing. And um, I think the speed that Sadia mentioned there is, is something that's, that's very important here, the speed with which these ideas are taken up. I'll come back to that in a moment around this notion of biodiversity. But yeah, so we see, you know, people like the notoriously racist uh, Prince Philip and, you know, the head of Shell Oil being key presidents and patrons of these organizations over the decades. Um, more recently, uh, former corporate CEOs with backgrounds in areas like Big Pharma are taking the lead. And these are organizations that have accumulated so much international money and power. Um, we're talking about hundreds of millions of US dollars for the three largest conservation organizations. They have so much influence um, over states' uh, sovereignty and norms um, that they're actually imposing a global model of how people should relate to other life forms really over the last century. Um, you know, and this involves displacing in many cases BIPOC systems and orders. Um, so what really troubles me is the idea that conservation, this notion that really we see developing from the 19th century onwards in places like the US and colonized spaces um, is you know, in this form led by these actors is coming to be seen as the only possible option for responding to extinction. And I worry that increasing calls for urgent action around it will only bolster this oppressive form of governance. And similarly, just to say a few words about biodiversity, um, really it's very rare these days to see any other term used to describe, or to describe Earth's life forms in conservation discourses, policy discourses. Um, really, you know, I think this is remarkable because this term is several years younger than I am. Um, when many BIPOC ways of caring for, yeah, I just made myself seem younger than I am there, but <laughs> um, many BIPOC ways of caring for, for plants, animals, earth, and water, are, we're talking tens of thousands of years old, millennia old, or literally timeless, right? Um, with biodiversity, we can trace the emergence of this concept to 1989, Washington, D.C., a conference um, you know, constituted by influential, mostly white male scientists, including E.O. Wilson, who I will come back to later, <laughs> lots to say about him. Um, you know, this is the same structure, the same intellectual structure that birthed the Washington Consensus, the whole system of structural investments to the global south and other neoliberal, neocolonial policies um, that have accelerated global inequalities. And, you know, biodiversity really comes from that. It, it and it, you know, it shows um, in its emphasis on things like redundancy and um, substitutability. Um, you know, it reflects what, what global capitalism needs life forms to be, and that is commodifiable, quantifiable, fungible, providing uninterrupted services to sustain existing orders and act as fixes for uh, the crashes that they're generating, as long as continually providing new kinds of values. So I think if we look at the short, as you know, as Sadia mentioned with the idea of extinction itself, this short but meteoric rise um, of these concepts, um, you know, what they're doing is they're destroying and displacing other kinds of relations. And I just wanna say, you know, I, I wanna be careful not to, to be too hard on people who do connect with these terms, not least because there is a such a you know hegemony, a dominance, um, and also such political and financial power behind them that they can be very hard to resist. And I, I do want to come back to you later some my starting points for how we might resist them, but you know I'll I'll leave it there for right now. Great, thank you so much for that exploration and education. I actually didn't know that the phrase was so young, the, the, the power behind the narrative that's been built around it, its connections to past geological eras has, has been such a great brand in a way. Um, and I really love how you connected the conservation and biodiversity. And I wanted to throw another term into the pot there, especially as you mentioned Shell, which would be ecocide. And I think it's really interesting if we think about accountability as well, when we talk about um, the devastation, the, the ecocide, the extinction, um, and often if we have extinction and it can be disconnected um, from the agents who have been created it. So I just wanted to bring, as we're bringing all these terms into this soup, um, to also think about 
yeah, the, um, the, in this new epoch that we're in, the, the human culpability as well of that, that there is accountability connected to that as well. Um, so we're going to go a little bit deeper now in terms of, um, yeah, unpacking this term. And um, our second question is around, you know, the idea of extinction, as you've mentioned, is established often with respect to animals. Um, and in your work, does it move beyond this context? Um, and what are the implications of using the term extinction beyond the context of animals and plants and other species as well? And we'll start with you, Audrey, on that one. Sure. So, yeah, I have I have uh, three points to make about this and I'll, I'll try to be quick, but I think, you know, one of the things we see with the, the labeling of certain plants and animals um, going extinct um, uh, when it's described when it's used to describe people. This is a really common and deep form of colonial racialized violence um, that makes people's, you know, rhetorically or, or, or frames them as extinct and then makes it more possible to enact this through genocide, land grabbing and legal political erasures. So and then again, as, as Sadia was mentioning before, before, um, these are come to be seen as natural processes or as inevitable processes, which is extremely problematic. Um, a couple of examples from, from Turtle Island, um, what's currently called Canada. Um, so the, the Sinex people in what's currently known as British Columbia uh, were declared extinct by the government in 1956, uh, largely in order to extinguish their legal uh, rights and claims to land, because in this part of Turtle Island, uh, very little of the land was actually ceded to colonizers. Um, so as a result, the very much extant uh, Sinex, Sinex people were recently penalized when they tried to exercise their hunting and fishing rights to go on their own land, uh, to the point that last year they had to send a delegation of elders to the Canadian Supreme Court to literally embody themselves and prove that they weren't extinct, right? So this shows to me the absurdity, but also the violence of this deep-seated narrative of extinction when it's applied beyond its origins within Western scientific biological context, but also how integral it is to colonial power. Um, another example is a, a plant uh, called Gete Akosamen, which is a squash. Um, and in the last few years around this region of Turtle Island, um, there's been stories around these uh, seeds of this squash, which is um, the, one of the stories says it's 850 years old, uh, or the, the, the seeds were, you know, um, from this squash were found in a, in a clay ball by settler archaeologists and then grown by settler students. Um, well, others actually argue that these seeds were kept um, alive the whole time throughout the entire history history of colonization by Miami um, female seed keepers who continuously grew and stewarded them and co-planted, um, including surviving her or their own people's, um, you know, massive expulsion to what's currently called Oklahoma. So when I received some of these seeds, I, I asked uh, female elders and gardeners about, you know, what stories they resonated with them. And I was surprised to hear that many of the elder women, and we've seen um, seed keeper uh, Winona LaDuke, a uh, very well-known Nishinaabekwe uh, person who um, actually named these, these squash, um, Gede Okosaman, they really like this clay ball story. And I think, you know, because it shows that the kinds of extinction, extinction that are imposed by settler colonialism and genocide can be reversed by this power of survival of indigenous peoples and their kin. Um, and it critiques that whole idea of irreversibility and inevitability of colonization itself. Um, so I think, you know, and the other story too shows indigenous refusals of extinction through this, these acts of knowledge, care, commitment, uh, love and kinship um, throughout these, you know, attempts to end their worlds. So to me, these are both refusals and refutations of extinction. Um, but, you know, one other thing that I, I just want to kind of highlight here is um, the fact that extinction recently we're seeing um, within many public discourses, political discourses, academic ones, this emphasis on human extinction, right? Um, and this is often framed in terms of apocalyptic ecological collapse, whether it's around climate change, the extinction of other species, or, you know, other, other factors, um, which is leading to really very ambitious, often deeply authoritarian, racialized global strategies that are um, framed as being intended to protect humanity at all costs, but are actually very misleading in terms of who they expect to bear those costs. So they're claiming to be, you know, universal and inclusive. Um, but when we look at the norms of humanity that are embedded in these notions of human extinction, they're often very Eurocentric, privileging, uh, privileging whiteness and gender binaries, ableist, etc. 
um, through which BIPOC and other marginalized peoples uh, have continued to be treated as less than human. So I'd recently published an article with my colleague Adita Chowdhury about how um, these discourses actually work to strengthen existing, uh, much like I mentioned about conservation, to strengthen existing structures and the distribution of, of life chances to those who are already most privileged. And these are being put forward often by people who are seen or see themselves as being very liberal, humanitarian, um, or progressive. Um, and what really alarms me here is that many of these discourses are framing the flourishing or even the survival of BIPOC and other marginalized communities as threats to the survival of humanity. We see this telegraphed in, you know, uh, references to population growth in the global south, to migration um, from places that are described, you know, uh, really um, uh, superficially as war-torn or poor without looking into why uh, people there suffer from violence. Um, you know, and it also, you know, we hear language and imagery being used that would often be used in the concept of genocide, for instance, describing population growth as cancerous or people overrunning white space is very, very disturbing language. Language. So um, I'm going to leave it there, but a little later I want to come back to how these uh, ideas of extinction and human extinction are converging in disturbing ways with mainstream conservation. Thank you, Audra. Thank you for that exploration and just, you know, a few things that came to mind, and this is going to be unpopular, but it also brings to mind our favourite, uh, David Attenborough, and, you know, such a love naturalist and how, you know, those concepts of um, protecting the natural world are twinned with population control and we've also seen some of that language around the coronavirus as well that coronavirus is good for the environment so I just want to say these are really critical um, reflections and very nuanced reflections that are really important at the moment in the context of climate justice so I just want to thank you for that um, and now I just want to hand it back to Sadia for this the same question to take us um, to zoom out and to bring this into the context around empire and, and settler colonialism. Uh, thank you so much. I'm deeply grateful to Audra for sketching out the legacies of some of the kind of ideas that I've been exploring, because I think when people hear the word extinction, they don't immediately think colonialism, racism, white supremacy, but that is where these ideas become rooted very, very quickly. So for instance, in the 19th century, um, you know, when all this research is going on about extinction, it moves beyond that context to thinking about animals, to thinking about people very, very quickly. And it's often within the context of settler colonies. And throughout the 19th century, you get claims that various peoples are on the verge of extinction or have already gone extinct. So the Biothoc in Newfoundland, Native Americans across America, Aboriginal Tasmanians, you know, um, various peoples in Africa are said to have died out or be on the verge of dying out. Um, I guess the most famous example of that is Darwin's Descent of Man, when in 1871 he writes that extinction follows chiefly from colonize, um, sorry, from, uh, from the competition of tribe with tribe and race with race. But what's really important is that he's writing in 1871 and this idea has been established for decades. You know, uh, and actually it's very, very common in the early modern period to talk about people going extinct, but what's happening and what's interesting in the 19th century is that the status of what that extinction means changes. Before you might get people talking about, you know, indigenous peoples being exterminated by colonists, for instance, but in the 19th century it shifts to extinction and what's happening is that settler colonial conflict is being naturalized as extermination, uh, as extinction. And it's through that naturalization that the idea that settler colon colonialism it, you know, the conquest and uh, dispossession that that entails is somehow a nat following a natural law. And of course, that has incredibly important legacies for how we talk about land rights and things today. You know, so if you just imagine the 19th century, for instance, a settler colonist making this kind of claim that, you know, for instance, that the Biothic are extinct or Aboriginal Tasmanians is extinct, that very conveniently extinguishes land rights claims. And of course, as Audra said, you know, Indigenous peoples are living with the legacies of that today to the point where they literally have to prove over and over and over again that they exist, you know, let alone have rights to their land, which they didn't cede in the first place. And so I think, you know, these connections between empire, racism, um, extinction, uh, extermination, you know, these, we're talking about genocide here often as well, is really, really important. And again, that the concept of genocide here I think is really really interest, uh, interesting and important because people often assume that genocide means total annihilation 
but the, I mean, it's legally not even defined as that. It's in whole or in part destruction. So when we're talking about people who've been subjected to genocide, we are almost always talking about communities that have survived, you know, um, and, but when people hear that term, they often kind of assume non-existence and therefore bring up these kinds of issues of justice and land rights again. And for me, it's absolutely critical that when we hear that word extinction, we think about the legacies and the histories of empire and colonialism, because people are fighting with the legacies of that and to this day in very very important ways and as we'll speak about later you know that has ongoing impacts on how we think about conservation how we think about you know who should bear the cost of uh what we now think of as conservation thank you Claudia. it's giving me so much pause for reflection for my own work that's been around um, solidarity and in allyship with indigenous communities resisting the Alberta tar sands um, and something that you know jumped out of me when you said that was when I started that work so much of the initial work was to even bring the awareness to the UK and Europe that indigenous people still existed in Canada we did countless speaker tours to talk about just the reality that indigenous people were there so how deeply that um, idea of um, going extinct has played into that to the point where the Minister of Natural Resources would often say no one lives up there, um, this is empty land, even that phrase in the middle of nowhere, how it has such a deep um, meaning and an erasure of not only the people from that land but also the deep relationship the ontological the spiritual the metaphysical relationship with that land as well so i think when we're talking about climate justice and environmental justice work the cultural work can often seem like the add-on but we're seeing here how deeply the awareness the relationship the history building of those communities who have survived through attempted genocides um, is crucial and I think another phrase that comes there and it really speaks to what you're saying is when we talk about genocide is also thinking about slow industrial genocide so for instance a lot of the communities that live downstream from the Alberta tar sands are subject to um, bioaccumulation of toxins um, their traditional foods having cancers and so this genocide takes many different forms and has become very sanitized in Canada in many ways so leading on from that and sort of making this bridge also to um, climate justice, um, you know, the UN acknowledges that 80% of the biodiversity that we have to protect is under the rights of indigenous peoples on ceded territories, um, all different relationships to the land. Um, and so, you know, we are in the middle of a biodiversity crisis that many people think of as the sixth extinction. So how can we, um, in your understanding, use the humanities and the work that you're doing to help us understand this moment to ground ourselves? So I'll start with you, Sadia, on that one. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I think there are many, many ways that humanities can help us think critically about this particular moment. Um, and for me, certainly, it's only by looking at these debates historically that we can see the ways in which um, the legacy of ideas about conquest, conflict and so on and settler colonialism you know that naturalizer of you know, extinction that I talked about that that has really important consequences for things like land rights um, but I think it can also help us trace the very idea the emergence of the idea of the sixth extinction and whether we should be cautious about that or not so for instance I've just been reading a book um, by David Sepkoski called Catastrophic Thinking um, and his father Jack Sepkoski was actually really really important for establishing ideas of mass extinction and in the book, David traces where some of the claims about the rate at which species are being lost come from. Um, and they actually come from a highly speculative estimates of ecological loss that are then applied to the globe as a whole. And it's through doing that careful tracking that actually we see that the very, that sense of panic that we are being encouraged to, in, uh, to, um, to nurture and then use that to justify really really deeply troubling forms uh of dispossession are uh, where, where that you know why it's so important to think about where that panic comes from and that it is speculative and david's very clear 
that you know he thinks that we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis and you know uh and that we are absolutely through human extraction and you know various forms of capitalist extraction losing animals at a greater speed than we have done but that's not necessarily the same as a mass extinction in the sense that paleontologists think of it but that slippage between mass extinction sixth extinction and the panic that it's being used to generate is really really important for the kinds of violence that is it is then effectively preparing us for you know who should lose out it, as we make decisions about how to respond to the sixth extinction and it's thinking about that kind of how that panic is generated and what it's being used to ask us to do that i think is really really important and where the humanities can help us do some meaningful work that is both helpful to us in terms of you know um if we are interested in, in the environment and conserving it and so on, but making choices that are not necessarily rooted or perpetuating the kind of genocidal and the kind of racist um, kind of thinking that we, we know extinction is rooted in. Thank you, Sadia. Um, and Audra, I want to bring that same question to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you, Sadia, for those thoughts. I mean, I think, like you, um, my work is very much involved in, in understanding violence. Um, I come from a very unusual field to be looking at these subjects, which is uh, international relations, global studies, um, although I am very rooted in, um, you, you know, what in Western academia we might call the humanities. Um, many of the communities with whom I collaborate, these boundaries are a lot less pronounced, you know, you look at things much more holistically. So I think it's very important to be bringing all of these viewpoints on it. Um, in particular, understanding extinction, as, as you mentioned, Sadia, in terms, for me, it's about thinking about um, multi-scale interlocking structural violence. So, for instance, how different forms of violence um, differently target racialized, gendered, LGBTQ plus and disabled bodies. You're talking about genocide there, um, you know, a big part of my work is trying to understand where and how concepts like genocide also may apply to uh, more than human, non-human, um, or other than human communities. So, you know, just thinking about um, um, a colleague, Tasha Hubbard, has written a really amazing piece um, about buffalo genocide. Um, and she's from an area relatively close to, to where Suzanne was mentioning in um, the, the prairies in, in Turtle Island. Um, so, you know, um, another area of the humanities that I think is incredibly rich and uh, powerful in thinking about how we want to address these, these crises um, is BIPOC futurism, speculative realisms, um, and even just straight up realisms <laughs> in literature film, the arts. Um, so for instance, some works I've been inspired by recently, uh, Wanyi writer Alexis Wright, Nishnabig uh, Quay thinker, um, Louise Erdrich's uh, Future Home of the Living God, um, novelists like Cherie Dimeline, who's Métis, Heisla Heltzak uh, writer Eden Robinson. Um, it's interesting to mention too, a lot of these are actually young adults or aimed at young adults. And I find them incredibly rich because they are looking towards future generations and then the future generations beyond that. Um, so, you know, in the stories and theories and worlds that these creators are, are putting out there, we can see how BIPOC communities are already coping um, at, with and enacting survivance against the intended ends of their worlds. So um, my colleague, um, Potawatomi scholar Kyle Powis White, he's written really powerfully about how, you know, this idea, when we're talking about urgency, we need to save the world. <laughs> For many people, their worlds have already been attacked, have already been not completely destroyed, absolutely not, but they have survived through the near destruction of their worlds. Um, and so what I'm seeing in these stories and theories and pieces of, of art and political action um, is how these, these peoples and worlds are seizing moments of rupture to reconnect with ancestral pasts and futures that are shaped by but not determined or constrained by racialized and colonial narratives of extinction. They're also offering very different kinds of protagonists or even heroes, if we you know, want to have that term. Um, these aren't the domineering individualistic white male heads of states and industry that we see in mainstream futurist and conservation discourses. Um, quite often these are BIPOC or multiracial, female or LGBTQ+, very young, very old, sometimes ancestral or spiritual beings, disabled or differently bodied, other than human. Um, you know, and, and the forms of agency that these 
these protagonists are adopting are, are very different and that they're embodying. It's not the unilateral imposition of instrumental strategies, but, you know, more decentralized, responsive, organic forms of organization and action. So, you know, I'm thinking here of Adrian Marie Brown's ideas of, around emergent strategy um, and pleasure politics, or Leanne Batasima Sack Simpson's theory of the creative intergenerational leadership uh, that she sees in goose migrations. Um, so, you know, I think these lived visions, they are offer radically different futures and ways of getting there, um, you know, forms of agency to lead those movements. Um, but one note is, it's, I think it's extremely important for white folks like me, who are the beneficiaries of these systems of oppression, not to see these narratives as more resources for us to mine um, in order to continue uh, centering ourselves and, and ensuring the survival of the systems that center us, but rather as other sources that we should be looking to follow and contribute to other forms of leadership, visioning, and future towards more, you know, just and flourishing worlds um, that don't center and or even necessarily include us. Thanks, Audra. Um, again, you just sparked so many thoughts and ideas. And, and one thing I was thinking about as you brought us into this idea of futurism and imagination is also thinking about, you know, in my own um, history, there's there's so many beings, like non-visible beings that are connected to these territories. And, you know, often thinking about science fiction lets us also acknowledge the beings that have gone into extinction and the other realms that also play a part of um, you know the metaphysics of these journeys as well so I think that's a, a really important part to bring the imagination to bring fiction into these um, things for you know I've been an interdisciplinary yeah. thinker often you know the spiritual the ancestral is so intimately connected to the relationship to the land you know so many of our stories and so many of our um, connections not only our stories or legacies from that place they also hold traditional ecological knowledge as well so I think that's also something to think about is that it's not just the extinction of um, these territories or the physical per se, but also the unseen and the ancestral as well. So thank you for bringing in that realm of um, the imagination and someone in the comments asked if we can uh, share those readings and we will definitely try and make those available to us um, to you at the end. Um, so sort of bringing us, we've been traveling around time and space and just sort of reflecting a little bit um, this summer, you know, with the, with the pandemic, we really saw the effects um, of human action on the planet by witnessing, you know, how the absence of common activities like flying and commuting, you know, we could actually see the sky for a change. Um, and these scenes have really prompted many of us to take you know, renewed calls for conservation efforts as we exit lockdowns and um, also being cautious about, you know, we're still seeing increases in emissions. Um, but how can, a, so how can a critical understanding of the concept of conservation help us make some decisions about where next? I'll give that to you, Audra. Okay. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, I think the most important thing that we can do, and when I say we, I mean, especially people of privilege, uh, white people like myself who are, as I say, uh, you know, kind of benefiting most from these forms of violence and promoting them most is to get past this idea that conservation is the only possible or effective response to the large uh, scale destruction of life forms. So what I want to propose is that we start actively divesting our money, labor, time, energy, and support from mainstream conservation uh, organizations or authorities, including states, who are promoting oppression, expropriation, and other forms of violence in order to cling to this existing order, really calling them to account, using the kinds of, um, you know, the, the, the multidisciplinary, plural kinds of thought and action that we were just talking about to really look at, as Sadia mentioned, what they're asking us to do and what we are becoming complicit in. And what we have been long complicit in. Um, you know, so in, in particular, I'm worried about a movement towards what I'm seeing or what I'm calling apocalyptic conservation. So this narrative uh, focuses around the convergence of those discourses of human extinction that I mentioned before um, with mainstream conservation. So again, to pick on WWF, you see in the most recent Living Planet report, many references to this idea that this is the last chance to save our civilization, right? Or humanity's survival being the stakes of conservation. It's pretty much, hey, if you don't do conservation, you're responsible for the world, the world ending, the only world. 
Um, you know, so, but when you look at what they're actually prioritizing for protection and promotion, even just looking at the language, the imagery and the symbols or infographics used, it's Eurocentric forms of wealth, health, instrumental relations uh, to nature and social structures um, that, they, that they're centering. Um, and as all of these things are coming to be seen as, as facing existential threat from, from extinction, climate change, and other ecological crises, we're seeing mainstream conservation organizations calling for extremely uh, draconian responses. Um, one of them being huge uh, scale big data surveillance, which amongst other things, um, you know, it's, it's not only is this a colonial remapping of, of earth, but um, these, you know, potentially could expose land defenders who are already heavily targeted by state violence, for instance, in areas such as the Amazon and the Philippines, but really all over the planet. Um, we see efforts to transform food systems largely by appropriating BIPOC knowledges and lands and calls for the large scale uh, annexation of, of land and water in the name of conservation. So, you know, perhaps the most egregious of these visions um, is E.O. Wilson's half earth proposal um, in which he advocates for dedicating 50% of earth's surface uh, to conservation. Um, this is the so-called land sparing approach um, that would in fact require removing all human activity from areas uh, zoned for conservation. Now, you know, what kind of models is Wilson thinking of when he says conservation? If you look at his book on the subject, he canonizes or really, you know, puts forward these super wealthy white male American landowners uh, who own land either in Turtle Island or far away in other parts of the planet, um, who are carrying out their own visions of conservation by privatizing land, working with states and military um, to realize those visions, um, you know, to protect ecosystems or life forms that they feel they have a special connection or ownership to. Um, and meanwhile, their ability to own or control these places is often due to genocide, wars, displacements of BIPOC people, other forms of mass violence, or even, you know, the degradation or so-called degradation of this land through settler colonialism. Um, you know, and when we look at the maps, um, I should have had one to show you here, but for the proposed land to be annexed to for this 50% of the globe, um, this is largely areas that Wilson and other white scientists persist in seeing as wilderness, right? Um, not not least because these are also often places that are seen as biodiversity hotspots and therefore valued within Western science and markets. Um, but these are these are indigenous and BIPOC lands, many of them lands that are under, you know, active um, land claim uh, struggles, rural spaces, you know, places that are absolutely anything but empty. So this is the doctrine of terra nullius all over again. Um, and it would, if we can imagine it actually being carried out, uh, constitute a bigger land grab than the early European European um, projects of, of colonization. Uh, so, you know, for myself and other white folks, we need to be fighting against these visions with all our might, um, you know, and really working to center uh, and amplify and support BIPOC efforts, um, taking all those resources that we can divert or uh, divest from mainstream colonial capitalist conservation towards BIPOC-led efforts um, to restore their unique political ecological orders. So things like land trust, legal defense for land defenders and work uh, or earth workers, land reclamation movements, um, just for one example, the land back movement or peasant led um, land reform, um, community based efforts to restore ecosystems and traditional relationships, and basically any initiatives that are, you know, aimed at restoring BIPOC sovereignties and, and legal political systems. That's really, I think, what what needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Audra. And I think that really brings us to this idea of um, really grounding when we talk about decolonization and when we talk about decolonizing the environmental movement, that that does not necessarily mean diversifying or having more of our faces in these conservation organizations. It's about really centering the sovereignty movements, the land rights movements, that that is the forefront of where we're heading. And I think that's been one of the biggest violences of um, you know, bringing this language of extinction in, that it has erased a lot of those strategies, not just those movements, but the strategies. And I think that's really, really key that when we're thinking about those communities, we think about the strategies that they hold, legal, um, challenging financial institutions, insurance in institutions all around their land rights. So I think that's a really um, powerful way to sort of steer us into understanding why we need to reclaim our movement histories as well. Uh, I just wanted to open up the chance, uh, Sadia, if you wanted to respond to that idea about um, just a critical reflection on conservation. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
so for me lockdown was a really extraordinary experience you know um it was i think it was a really important moment in showing people who are deeply skeptical about the true effects of our consumption on the world uh, just what an impact we have you know seeing uh, pictures of animals venturing out into places they might not have been before or seeing clear skies over polluted cities showed that it's absolutely possible to effect change and relatively quickly with action but it's action we haven't previously taken because it brings a kind of discomfort that most people do not want to accept might be necessary so the possibility of you know consuming less of you know or not having the same you know as Audra was saying that we can't necessarily uh conserve everything as well as a keep our keep the structural order as it is it's just not going to work so we need very very different ways of thinking about conservation and so that I think what brings up what that brings up is that conservation and environmental change in these debates are absolutely not value neutral every time we commit resources to a particular species for instance we're usually making a value judgment about why that species should be preserved and it's very easy to convince people to try and save beautiful species or charismatic species um, you know uh, but it's much harder to convince them that insects matter or bacteria matter um, or you know and and it's and it's those kinds of value judgments about conservation that people are making that need to be exposed, to be seen for what they are and to be thought radically rethought so that at the forefront of what we do in these movements and when we have these discussions, genuine justice is at the heart of what we're asking for and justice for all beings, not just asking for justice for those who are already privileged or those who have already benefited for various kinds of violences over the centuries and so on. Um, that mean that by an accident of birth we may be using considerably more of the earth's resources and so on and therefore uh, be less inclined to give up you know those resources that we're using and so I think it's really really important to use this moment to think about priorities but also as those priorities are being created what we value and what who are we asking to make sacrifices and who are we asking to bear the burden here? Because I, I really, really think conservation is one of those words that people just, when they hear it, they think very much instantly, that's something I can get behind. It's something incredibly positive. It's something that makes me feel good for contributing to, but we need to back away from that and think much, much more critically about the value judgments that are being made that are involved in those conservation. And, um, in those conversations about conservation because as Audra said there are deeply worrying and deeply violent solutions being proposed to this and if people aren't aware of that you know um we're, we're heading for a very scary place yeah I think you've got a great podcast title there conversations about conservation <laughs> um yeah you and again so many so many things to respond to there and I think one of the first things is really thinking about all of the work that we do for ecological protection as an ecosystem itself you know um the CEO of Amazon just gave you know a large sum of money to many conservation organizations um who are working on climate on the one hand yet on the other hand we're having these labor um, violations, these devastations to the communities there. So we have to constantly think about how do all of these conservation organizations, how do they work in synergy with each other? And how do we see ourselves as a as an ecosystem of strategies? And sometimes it's difficult to have those critical reflections, but I think it's exactly what you were saying, why this moment is so crucial. Um, and the other thing was around, um, I think, decolonization. And as an artist, um, this is where so much of my practice comes in around decolonizing um, our own relationships to the elements and to the, the beings um, and not just in a way that is um, sort of personifying but really coming into collaboration for instance a lot of my work is around water so how do we come into collaboration with water how do we really think about knowledge systems that that break down those binaries um, and I think that reflects you know some of the movements for the rights for water the rights for rivers so really sort of breaking down some of these binaries or divisions between the species even, I think something that's what this idea of extinction can even uh, harden the, the boundaries between the species. So is there a way that we can blur those as well to sort of bring ourselves back into relationship as well? 
Um, and so on that note, sort of bringing it back to this, um, this kind of curve that I mentioned at the beginning of, you know, when we're talking about um, extinction, it brings up so many feelings around loss and grief. And I think, you know, the reason why we, we move into those spaces and into those feelings is so that we can to eventually emerge out of them. And it's it's not necessarily a one way process, it's a cycle. Um, so just wanted to hear some, give some space for some thoughts and reflections on, you know, how do you relate to um, the work that you do around remembering um, and mourning and how can that be problematic if we get too much into the white tears um, and, and appropriation of that struggle, but how can also it be um, a possibility for us to also come into relationship? So I just wanted to, um, yeah, how does that give us a pathway to understand the past, to be in the present, to move to the future? Um, so we're going to start with you, Audra, this time. Sure. Yeah, well, and thank you for that prompt and for all of your really rich thoughts throughout this before, you know, the end of it. I wanted to really thank you, Suzanne, for that. Um, so, yeah, so I, I've written a bit about um, the problems that can arise when white folks like myself engage in mourning for uh, species or life forms that we think of as being lost or, or endangered. Um, and you mentioned there this problem of white tears, um, which involves, you know, really white people crying over harms that we ourselves have caused, and in so doing, appropriating others proportionately greater pain um, not least to distance ourselves from a feeling of culpability um, and often displacing um, or crowding out the emotions and experiences of those who have borne the most direct brunt of the harms and questions. Um, so, you know, I've, I've argued that uh, white dominated processes of mourning for lost species on a global scale can have a similar effect uh, when we white people cry for life forms with which our only real relation um, is one of possession, consumption and or colonial dominance. Um, you know, and I'm thinking of being as, as a white settler uh, brought up with, you know, little soft toys of elephants or of tigers. And these are animals that, you know, I was raised to think I had some kind of claim to without actually having any kind of kinship relation or reciprocal relation of responsibility. Um, so, so yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think um, when we do this, we're, we're crowding out people who actually do have those relations, relations of kinship, ancestry, cohabitation, coevolution. Um, and, you know, we're, when white people do this, we're, we're obscuring um, their greater claim to connection with these life forms and, and to mourn for these life forms. And we're entrenching these ideas of colonial ownership or entitlement. Even when we understand, um, I think, you know, again, I mentioned this notion of humanity. Um, when the, the mainstream norm of humanity is so focused on whiteness and on Eurocentric uh, uh, notions of what it is to be human, um, thinking of, of Earth's, you know, life forms as the property of humanity really creates the same problem. Um, I think the term loss too can distance us, and again speaking here of, of white people and people of privilege, um, from a sense of culpability in the forms of violence that we're benefiting from and that are driving extinction or, or the destruction of life forms. I also worry that it's, oh, we've got a creature passing there, um, a slightly passive uh, or a very passive term really, similar to this idea of, oh, we're, we're going extinct. We're just gonna, we're just gonna go extinct <laughs> rather than being extincted, being subjected to violence, right? Um, and I think that sometimes when white people emphasize our sense of loss and grief, it can really make those, those different harms seem equivalent. So. You know, I've been thinking a lot about how can we as, uh, you know, as white people or people of privilege, um, I'm mostly speaking to here, um, remember and grieve differently as a collective. It's definitely not my place to be telling other people who do have those uh, relations how to grieve. Um, but for people who are, you know, trying to find a better way to show solidarity, I think a good starting point is to see remembrance as being not just about what's gone, but also about pasts, presents, and futures and the ways that they're interwoven. Um, so we can start by remembering how, you know, for me, how I came to be in any kind of relation to the life forms that I'm grieving or that I'm afraid to lose. Um, in particular, for me, it's thinking about the forms of violence, oppression, inequality, and privilege that brought me into those relations and allow me to, to still think of myself as having them. Um, I'm trying to work towards remembering every day who co-created and is continuing to co-create these life forms and ecosystems, who their kin are, and who are continually putting their lives on the line to protect them. 
So I think, you know, white people and people of privilege um, can create space for grief, rage, mourning, and myriad other responses of those who are shouldering um, the majority of the burden, um, but also including recognizing and, and, you know, centering and amplifying the creativity, joy, vision, and brilliance of BIPOC worlding that's happening in response to all of these forms of violence. Um, and part of doing this involves for people like me stepping back, um, following others' leadership, and accepting responsibility and criticism um, without centering our own needs and our own desire to mourn, um, either to mourn for other life forms or for our own you know, false sense of innocence. Um, so I think we can work towards moving through grief in active solidarity, as I mentioned before, by throwing our support behind BIPOC communities who are and who have been reworlding through all of these forms of destruction. So, you know, that's really what I hope that the collective work of, of remembering that does involve white folks like myself, um, but hopefully centers others. I hope that's what it can achieve. And I really, you know, I, I really am so um, honored to, to be asked to be part of this, um, this discussion um, of what I think is, you know, a, a real effort on the part of the, uh, the folks, the organizers of um, Remembrance Day for Lost Species to move towards that kind of approach. Thank you, Audra. And Saudi, I just wanted to create space too as well for you to bring any reflections on the role of remembering. Thank you. Um, I think for me, remembering is about having a full, the fullest sense we can of the violence um, of ideas about extinction and how they've created problems and legacies that create really, really serious ongoing injustices. And I think that's really important because remembering all that is good. I think it's really important that we hold those histories in mind, but remembering should also be, I think, a spur to thinking about action and a future that is more just. You know, if all we do is remember and grieve, then I don't think that's a very productive thing at all. But also, I just don't think it's very helpful. And I think one of the ways that you can see that, for instance, is in the kinds of ideas about grief and loss that we see in debates about de extinction. Um, for me, de extinction is really, really troubling in all kinds of ways. Um, because what we're seeing is without much oversight, the creation of basically genetically modified organisms that are going to be the intellectual of the all um that are known how the focus there on creating these the intellectual property as a form of just as a form of justice rather than thinking about you know land rights for instance i think is really really troubling and for me, it often comes when I read about the people who are involved in this or are really, really keen on the extinction. I, I'm thinking very much of kind of, um, you know, uh, modifying organisms with genetic engineering rather than rewilding, for instance. It's, it's often a sense of just complete inability or complete unwillingness to let go um, of something that has happened in the past and think about a just future. And I, I, I think there's all sorts of things that we need to think about in terms of grief, loss, remembrance that are playing into our ideas about conservation. Um, we, as I say, without much oversight at the moment, but as you know, Audra said, we are already living in a moment where people who have experienced um, over and over again through the generations, the, the, the effects and the legacies of these kinds of discussions are already imagining. Um, you know, a, a better and, and more just future. And that's what we should be focused on, you know, building that kind of, on, on, on inter, interspecies justice. So where remembrance facilitates that, I think it's very, very important. Where it doesn't, I'm kind of, I am concerned about the kinds of things it might lead to. But for, as I say, you know, there is, there is the possibility of hope. And I think that's another thing that when people think about extinction, they often don't connect it. With the idea of hope at all but there is a possibility for hope and for change and for justice and that's where remembrance should be taking us. Thank you Sadia, thank you for that powerful um, bringing us full circle and before I pass back to Percy I just wanted to thank you both um, as I mentioned at the beginning so much of um, the language around extinction has really brought up many problems for many of us who work in the climate justice arena. Um, and, you know, I'm so grateful to have this time to philosophically um, unpack where some of these issues and implications for this language 
um, life for communities of color. So I just want to thank you again. I'm going to be re-listening to this and, and continuing to, um, you know, come in a, such a good way um, to our white allies to understand just the, the reality of the dangers of, of using such language um, and also the power and the need for safety for us to, to philosophize and to understand and unpack um, the history of this language and how we can move through that and move through the grief and understanding each other so we can begin to use this opportunity to understand the ancestors, the strategy the ways of being, the ways of relating to the land that we have that are going to get us through, um, hopefully through another extinction. As you said, Sadia, before, many of us have lived through many extinctions and we are committed with joy and with wholeheartedness to survive this one too. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Kirsty. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, and goodbye, um, and thank you so, so much to uh, Sadia and Audra. <laughs> uh, that, was, that, was a, that was a huge conversation, um, so much to take in. Um, we will be transcribing the talk before we share it um, with subtitles on YouTube and, um, you know, providing more biased ways to kind of get to the huge range of topics that the speakers have um, addressed. Um, so I think we can, uh, yeah, deepest thanks to you three um, for setting the tone and setting us off on an evening of, um, and a weekend of inquiry. We're gonna take a comfort break um, and anyone who wants to come back at half past um, to talk um, without the speakers here, um, in, um, you know, smaller sort of self-facilitated groups. Um, we'd love to get back together and uh, further and deepen the conversation and get to know each other a little bit more. So yeah, see you in 10 minutes. For those of you who want to come back, get a cup of tea, have some food and come back for more conversation. Thank you so much, Sadia. Thank you so much, Audra and Suzanne. That was really amazing. <laughs>